I think you now understand why I made this ring here to produce a little bit of a taper. I should have had one made for this side too, but boy that's a small thin piece to try to produce. And I probably should have taken a little care here to, to file that a little bit or fill it in to smooth it out to prevent the sand from uh, breaking loose. Oh well. Closed up, ready to pour. I usually put something over there to cover it if I don't get around to pouring it for a half hour or so that nothing falls in there. I poured the mold about 15 minutes ago, so let's take a look at it. Still kind of hot. Well, there it is. That's the little spot that fell in that I talked about earlier. That's not going to hurt anything, especially since it's on the back side. So I'll let that cool off. Take it downstairs. We're going to saw off the gate and start to clean it up. The mold has been poured, and here's the finished casting. I'm back down in the basement. And you can see now, We'll look for a few def defects here. I'll be critical here of this. Uh, remember that uh, a casting is never quite as, as good as the original, especially when I'm making a casting from a casting. I've said that uh, many times. I'm going to cut this off here presently and file it. But this is the spot that fell in where the sand stuck to the, uh, uh, the pattern here, if you remember. And that's going to be on the inside, so it won't show up anyway, so I'm not going to throw it away for that. Now I need to file all the way around here. You see, that's the parting line that I made when I parted it down. And uh, you can see that I'm not always really right in the middle. For instance, right here, I, I'm a little bit high. So there's a little that fell in. Remember, any kind of undercut will cause the sand uh, to, uh, to catch. But overall, not a bad casting. Needs to be uh, drilled here and here and, and uh, cleaned up. So first thing, I'll saw this off here on a bandsaw and recycle that next time I make a casting. I have rough filed uh, the periphery of the hand wheel and I've got the hub part of it uh, mounted in a three-jaw chuck. You know, originally I have the all pre-center punch stuff uh, so that I wouldn't have to worry about this that I could do it on the drill press but those kind of fell in and I, I think this is probably is a better method so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, center drill this and ream it 3 eighths is the final size that I want taking a, a a light, uh, light pressure on this so it doesn't fly out of there. You always worry a little bit because it's not holding by a whole lot. But at least this will get the hole right in the center and it runs fairly true for a casting. You know, a casting is never going to run right on. And now I'm reaming uh, 3 eighths of an inch. I'm only taking a 64th off. I still have it in the chuck like this. I ran my spring-loaded live center up into that hole to support it so it can't fly out of there. And because in my mind it's still held rather precariously. And I'm going to give her a few strokes of the file here. I'm using a double-cut uh, coarse file. Sure and roll up your sleeves and use a file with a handle on it when you're working on the lathe. Then I'll also polish it uh, lightly with some 
abrasive cloth. That's what it looks like to this point. It's not too bad. Now I'll take those little half round coarse file and clean up the spokes just a little bit. Knock that flashing off. You'll almost always get some kind of flashing uh, on the parting line on castings. Sometimes these are tumbled or put in a vibratory uh, abrasive uh, for hours and that removes all those edges and uh, that's like a hired hand. You can walk away from it. Now I need to drill and ream this hole one fourth inch for the uh, handle or the crank handle. But you know I went to all this effort if you remember of making this little plug here with center holes in it uh, with uh, great expectations that uh, that hole would be pre -pun center punched uh, for me. But in fact the sand stuck in those holes and all was for naught. So I had to dress this off just a little bit and, and center punch it uh, as if I had never uh, gone to that uh, trouble. And so now I will pilot drill this. This is the original crank handle. Just press fit in there. And uh, I need one for the new one so I did uh, in my uh, junk drawer have several of those uh, crank handles and uh, but none that would press fit on this is approximately the same size a little bit larger but it has a 1 4 20 thread on the end so I have a little change of plans here where I will drill and tap my new aluminum hand wheel to fit this and I'm going to uh, Loctite that in place then you know uh, it's nice to have crank handles that that spin but on the smaller ones uh, we just have friction on our fingers as it turns but you will see that feature on bigger and more expensive machines where they spin the hole is drilled and now I will tap it 1 4th 20 all the way through there it is weighs about half of what that cast iron does let's take a look at it now hit it with a file. No, that's good enough. Could paint it gray. There's yet uh, one more step that we need to do or I need to do and that is to make a keyway. This is a 3 30 seconds wide keyway. There's the little Woodruff half moon key that I'm going to use. 3 30 seconds thick. Now the logical way to do this of course would be with a brooch but my brooch set does not go that small the smallest I have is eighth inch or maybe it's even 3 16 so I'm going to do this by another method I'm going to use a slotting tool that I made uh, and I'm going to do it on the closing lathe so uh, but before I do uh, a couple things here first of all I have made another video on that which may or may not yet be uh, up on YouTube, but it's uh, tips number 151, cutting a keyway on the closing lathe. And it's really very similar to, to what I'm doing here, if not identical. But So take a look at that also, because what I'm going to show you now is a really an abbreviated or, uh, 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 video of this. You know, that's just going to be a couple minutes long rather than however long this one is, 15 or more minutes, so the detail will, will not be in this one. Also, if you haven't seen these two videos, these are also the ones uh, on irregular parting lines. One, uh, if you do a YouTube search, put Tubal Cane in every one of your searches too. Foundry Work uh, Molding Irregular Parting Line is, is the title of that one. That's before I did the tip series, I think. But Machine Shop Tips number 108 is the other one making a guard did I spell guard wrong? for a South Bend lathe so tips 108. Both of those are irregular parting line molding jobs you may find those of interest if you like molding a little bit off of the machine shop topic but uh, they're molding so now let's step over to the closing lathe and I'll show you how I'm going to make that keyway the hand wheel is back in the three jaw chuck. I'm going to lock the spindle just by putting it in uh, back gears because I do not want this to turn uh, to rotate. The uh, 
I'm not going to use the motor. This is a hand operation. Now the tool is already in there, but let me let me take it out. And I've got the tool mounted in uh, the Sorola tool holder. Remember what I told you about Sorola? Did I tell you that or not? One Mr. Frank Sorola invented and patented the first quick change toolbox, a tool post. Uh, notice that Sorola backwards is Alaris. The same as Count Alucard is Dracula backwards. I like that for some reason. I'll probably repeat that over and over until I drive you nuts. But uh, I took a, a 330 seconds cutoff tool, ground it as such, got some end relief on it. I've got it held on there uh, in this uh, Sorola holder here uh, using another cutoff tool backwards in there, you know, to, to offset the angle so that this is at the right angle. I've already set it so it will be on the center and all I'm going to do is go back and forth, back and forth each time uh, feeding it up a little bit uh, forming my hole. It'll, it'll cut real easily I think in this, uh, in this aluminum and uh, I, I'm using it like a shaper really so I'm slotting. Now if one owned a slotting attachment for a bridge port and I do not uh, that would be another good method other than a brooch. A brooch would be ideal. Okay. Do you understand what I'm doing here? I'm going to slot back and forth like this. Feeding in a little bit with each pass, you know, four or five thousandths, for a total depth of about one hundred thousandths. That isn't going to be all that critical, but that's about what the handbook calls for. Now I've set the carriage stop so you can hear me going thunk thunk when I bottom it out. That way I don't have to get in here and look back there, but I have my little flashlight here so I can look at that too. And there'll be a little chip that will curl off and it'll be in the back, but uh, it'll look similar to a broaching chip. I have locked the spindle so this isn't going to rotate and I'm not going to touch the motor switch. Wouldn't be a good idea to unplug the lathe if that was easy enough because sometimes there's a natural tendency to want to turn the switch on. I'll be taking a few passes now. It may not even appear that I'm cutting. I'm just taking a few thousands off with each pass. I think some of you know what I'm talking about when I refer to the slotting attachment for a bridge port. It goes on the back of the ram. They made a lot of them. They very seldom get used. I'm not using any cutting fluid. Perhaps I should be. I hope you can see uh, in this close-up and that I'm in focus uh, the keyway I'm about halfway down to the depth you can see some chips in the bore and let's take a look at it from this view I hope this shows up it's hard to position the camera sometimes That's about 80 thousandths. I'm feeding it away from me just a little bit. You're not going to see that at all with each pass. Actually, I'm watching what I'm doing now through the camera viewfinder rather than the work itself. Indirect. Take a couple passes now without increasing the feed to clean it up. And I believe I'm done and ready to take it out and show it to you. 
There's the finished keyway. Remember that this tool was 3 30 seconds wide, so that it gave me the correct width, at least pretty close. I probably went a little deeper this way, but I wanted to make sure I had uh, what I needed. Uh, I'm a little bit over a, a 100 thousandths. The finished job, keyway cut, crank handle on. Again, that is a irregular parting line, and it would have been a split pattern originally. And I made a casting from a casting because I didn't have a pattern, and that is the way to do it. And you can do that on, uh, on many different pieces. Ideally, we'd like to have this made of cast iron. Now, several people have emailed me uh, about making cast, uh, castings of cast iron. I have done it once when I was in a college shop. It is not something that is practical to do at home. I'm not saying that nobody can do it, but I, if, if you are able to make cast iron castings at, in a home shop or in your, in your yard, you are in the uh, uh, one percentile. It's just, uh, uh, or is it not? Yeah, or is it the 99 percentile? Anyway, it is just not something that is practical to do. The heat from it is beyond belief. I know that it's about uh, twice the temperature of aluminum, but uh, and 400 degrees hotter than brass. But it is hot, and it is almost impossible to get that heat uh, from gas and a uh, and a blower. You, you need to do it by, the, uh, by a cupola. So, uh, so no, don't try it. Uh, well, if you, you try it, but without my blessing, because I really don't know much about it. I have to stick to aluminum, something that I'm able to do and I know a little bit about. And uh, so much for that. Uh, but uh, this is aluminum. Um, that completes this lesson. It'll, it's a long video. It's going to be in two parts. So, be sure and watch my other videos, and this is Tubal Cain saying happy casting and uh, so long for now. And there it is, the Half Moon Key.